So this presentation will be an introduction to trauma-informed pedagogy. I wanted to create a short presentation on trauma-informed pedagogy because I keep seeing it mentioned in the Chronicle of Higher Education and other discussions happening between educators in the time of COVID-19. So what is trauma? Psychological trauma occurs when the human self-defense system becomes overwhelmed and disorganized. Traumatic events are usually accompanied by feelings of intense fear, helplessness, loss of control, and threat of annihilation, which result in emotional, cognitive, and biological changes. I have seen from multiple sources that 70% of the population has experienced trauma. So this is a good thing to learn about anyway, but it is particularly timely right now because we are all experiencing a collective trauma in this time of illness, economic upheaval, and social upheaval. Trauma greatly reduces our executive function. The definition of executive function is an, an individual's neuropsychological ability to control and coordinate their thoughts and behavior, such as through planning, selective attention, organizing, response inhibition, and working memory. You will notice that many aspects of executive function are critical in the learning process. So hopefully it is easy to understand why educators should be concerned with how trauma would affect students' ability to learn. So what is our role as teachers? Trauma-informed pedagogy does not say that educators should become counselors and doctors. Karen Costa, who is an expert in trauma-informed pedagogy, introduces the concept of scope of practice, which she has found used in medicine and sociology and other professions, although she says she does not see it very often in the field of education. She defines it as what procedures, tasks, and job responsibilities fall within your range of expertise and which do not. And she gives some examples of teaching yoga that it is within her scope of practice to encourage a participant to keep coming to class and pr practice self-care, but not which vitamins to take or medical advice. Our role as teachers is to address what we can in the learning process and in the classroom and also to refer students to other services available on campus when that becomes necessary. So here are some of the tips that I have found for trauma-informed online pedagogy during COVID-19. The first is balance, flexibility, and structure. In many of the self-care articles that I've seen in the Chronicle of Higher Education in the last few months, they talk about the importance of schedules and structure when designing a course, structure is also very important in managing your workload. However, in these times of upheaval, it is also important to be flexible. I recently listened to a podcast where one of the presenters said he was overwhelmed with how many professors were asking him whether they should allow students to be able to submit assignments an hour or two late. He felt very strongly that professors should have deadlines, but also be understanding of students individually if they are a little bit late on a particular assignment or if they have circumstances that are unique to them that merit some understanding on the professor's part. Author Flower Darby has an interesting suggestion. She calls it an oops token that she offers to most of her online students at the beginning of the semester. This token is good for one late assignment or the ability to revise a paper if they aren't happy with a grade. And at the end of the semester, if a student has not used their OOPS token, it is worth some extra credit points. So this would have to be worked out in your syllabus and introduced carefully at the beginning of the semester, but this is one option for providing flexibility without providing too much flexibility. And you can find out more about the OOPS token in the book Small Teaching Online, which the Snowden Library offers as an ebook. So the next tip is show care. Karen Costa, who I introduced earlier in this presentation, says, above all else, educators should prioritize care. She also argues that empathy is within everyone's scope of practice. The next tip is be human. So you can be honest about what's going on. For example, why you have fallen behind on grading, what challenges you are working with, such as working from home or caring for a sick kid or parent, 
This does not mean oversharing. We need to respect interpersonal boundaries and classroom norms, but we can focus on where the personal and professional overlap. One way you can set the ground for this is to create an introduction video at the very beginning of a class that introduces you and aspects of your life that you're willing to share with your students, such as a picture of your family, introduce your pets, hobbies, and perhaps give them a tour of your workspace, which can help make up for the lack of physical presence in the classroom. The next tip is build community. When I have done research on reducing anxiety for my own son, over and over again, I found that building social connections was really, really important. So as an educator, you can foster community between you and your students and design activities that foster community among each other. One example is to break students up into smaller discussion groups, which they may keep the entire semester. Just as you created a video to introduce yourself, you can have students create their own introductory videos at the beginning of a course. And given the challenges of online education and community building, this is a complex topic enough that I will be creating another presentation on this soon. The next tip is create a safe learning environment. So people can be meaner online with the anonymity of an online presence than they would be in a face-to-face classroom. Jay Howard wrote a book on discussion in the college classroom and says that professors should take some time to teach netiquette and set the expectations for how we expect students to engage each other online. As a professor, you can provide encouragement in discussion forums and synchronous meetings through Microsoft Teams to students to show that it is a safe environment for learning. When students do participate in discussions and offer answers to questions, try to find something good in every answer, even if some of it needs to be corrected or redirected. And there's much that you can do to build confidence in every class, particularly at the beginning of the semester. You can outline some activities that help them understand what is expected in the course and have each of those worth some points Throughout the class, you can help them build confidence by giving them practice quizzes that they can retake until they are happy with their performance. Choice is important in trauma-informed pedagogy because it empowers students. Remember that within the definition of trauma, there are strong feelings about lack of control. And so one thing that you can do is to provide choices to students to show that they are in control of their learning. Again, in the book Small Teaching Online by Flower Darby, she talks about some activities that you can do with annotating syllabi. In this, students can work in groups to annotate the course syllabus and suggest changes so that they have some say in how the course works. You can also provide choices in assignments so they can choose between two or three options that helps them get to the same learning goal that you have set out for them. In times of trauma, particularly shared trauma, such as COVID-19, it can be really beneficial for students to have class time and opportunities to talk about what's going on and how they're feeling. However, it needs to be an option to not share. So that may be allowing a student to sit out of a discussion or giving them an alternative assignment. If you ask students to journal, be sure that the directions for journaling are not asking them to share something that they don't want to share. Next is clarity. With reduced executive function and attention, students need extra help knowing what to do and what's expected of them. All directions that you give them should be written so that students can go back and refer to them as needed. This is a screenshot of how I set up my first year seminar class that I taught two years ago. And I tried to make it really clear what was the homework for each week. I'm not sure if this current screenshot is how the formatting originally appeared. I now find this a bit confusing that there is a space after the day of the week, rather than having the space show exactly which day of the week corresponds to which activity. 
I created this when I was only concerned with letting them know what they needed to accomplish as homework, as opposed to the activities that we would do in class. So as I am thinking of how I would move this online if I were teaching in the fall, one of my struggles is to make it very clear what is due when. Any links to assignments and activities I would put right after each day of the week that it where it was due, as opposed to putting it at the bottom where it may be unclear which day of the week any of those activities or links or resources corresponded to. Now this screenshot also only shows short-term goals. This is week four, so it's early in the semester, where students are reading materials and discussing in class, but don't have as many assignments due as they would later on. I would make it very clear which longer-term projects that they should be working on at this time if I was designing this for online learning during COVID-19. The next tip is to consider cutting content. I know that this is often controversial as I teach public speaking and first year seminars where content is less important than many other courses taught on campus. I say this with all humility and I'm just passing on what I have read. I just finished reading Jay Howard's book, Discussion in the College Classroom, and he cited a number of studies that show that active pedagogies with less content lead to more meaningful learning. So during times of trauma, such as COVID-19, consider whether you really need to cover as much content or whether you can focus on less content but more activity among the students if it is more likely to lead to meaningful learning. And the last tip is to reduce cognitive and affective load. So cognitive load is the idea that your brain can only do so much at a time. And there are tricks for spreading out the cognitive load and designing pedagogies that make the most of how our brains work. Some suggestions are keeping activities streamlined, such as what I showed in the tip on clarity, breaking up big projects so that students can set their sights on shorter goals, such as an outline first, then an annotated bibliography, then a draft, each of which leads up to a larger final project. And as you create learning objects, such as recorded lectures, consider how hard it will be for your students to process those learning objects and see if there's anything that you can do to make them easier to process. Finally, consider the emotional weight of the material being covered. For example, it may be a good idea to connect the course content to current events, but as the current events are so overwhelming, you don't want to do it too much. So looking over these tips, I hope you come to the same conclusion that I did, that it is important to be informed about trauma-informed pedagogy, but all of these tips are simply good pedagogy. Perhaps in a time of trauma, you focus more on clarity and compassion, but all of these things lead to better learning and benefit many learners, such as English language learners or students with many distractions at home or students with learning disorders. So I hope you found this video useful and thank you for watching.